uh, let us begin, if that's okay. Uh, first of all, on behalf of uh, SILPA and our partners, I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for accepting to be part of this ILSA Nuremberg Academy and ISIL uh, roundtable on uh, today's uh, ICC OTP series, which is focusing on the achievements and challenges of the Office of the Prosecutor. I would like to especially thank uh, Catherine Amafar, the president of the American Society of International Law and her colleagues, and then Dr. Vivian uh, Dietrich, uh, deputy director uh, from the Nuremberg International Principles Academy for agreeing to co-sponsor this event on behalf of their respective organizations. Additionally, I would like to thank in advance our moderator, uh, Ms. Lorraine Smith Van Leen, and our panelists, Mr. Lita de Souza Diaz, Mr. Kevin Heller, Ms. Sarah Cassande, and of course, Mr. Alex Whiting, for taking time out of their very busy schedules to participate in today's event as speakers. Uh, on behalf of SILPA, we are very delighted to have such a stellar group of academics, practitioners, and civil society members from diverse regions of the world speaking to this very, very uh, important uh, topic. Uh, we look forward to your insights uh, on this panel. Before moving to the substantive part of the program, I'd like to invite Ms. Catherine Amafar, who is the president of ASIL, uh, to provide some opening remarks. Uh, she has a very extensive background and bio, so I'm not going to do justice to it, but I do want to introduce her very briefly. Uh, Catherine Amafar is a litigation partner in the International Dispute Resolution Group and co-chair of the firm's Public International Law Group. Her practice focuses on international commercial and treaty arbitration, international complex commercial litigation, and public international law. Uh, before uh, joining the Bevois in 2016, she spent uh, two years as a counsel at the State Department advising on issues of international law uh, um, and foreign relations on behalf of the uh, United States, uh, which of course she has also represented in several international fora. So Ms. Amafa, of course, is here in her capacity as president of the American Society of International Law and before becoming president had actually served as vice president. Uh, Catherine, you have the floor, ma'am. Thank you so much, Charles. I'm, I'm very glad to be here with you today on behalf of ASIL to take part in this colloquium. And it won't surprise anyone to hear that in addition to being a, a founder of SILPA, Charles is a leader at the society and someone who are truly privileged to count among our own. Now, it goes without saying that SILPA is an important and frankly much needed addition to the community of organizations bringing different voices to the research policy and practice of international and regional law. SILPA will continue to contribute greatly to enriching the conversation around international law with the important variety of perspectives on these issues found within the continent of Africa. And crucially, SILPA conveys to the world that there are different perspectives, including within African legal, legal scholarship on these issues and how we as a global community of international lawyers should work together with all of our different insights to make this system one that works better for the people of the world. So I'm particularly delighted to be here today at a colloquium devoted to the important question of the International Criminal Court and key challenges that lie ahead for the Office of the Prosecutor and frankly, for the ICC as a whole. I think we can all agree that this is a timely question to ask. And it's critical that organizations like SILPA and ASIL pool the resources of our members to undertake the independent review of international organizations like the ICC. Even as we want to see them succeed, we owe a duty of care to evaluate and hold to a high standard the institutions that are supposed to speak on behalf of the world. And certainly the society's recently published report from the Presidential Task Force on Policy Options for US Engagement with the ICC, on which Charles served as a very valued member of the advisory group, represents that kind of independent review role that organizations like ASO, like SILPA, are well placed to play. And I commend that report to this audience in particular as we grapple with the questions surrounding the ICC. So let me end just by saying that we at the Society look forward to working with SOPA and our other colleague societies and regional institutions to continue the conversations about the way in which the U.S. can contribute to international justice and accountability. 
So with that, let me turn things back over to Charles for our other welcome remarks. Thank you very much for having me. Well, thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for those uh, thoughtful opening remarks and, of course, your uh, kind words uh, to me. I'm very grateful. Um, I'd like to now invite uh, Dr. Vivian Dietrich, who is the Deputy Director of the uh, Nuremberg Academy. Uh, but before I turn the floor over to her, let me just say a couple of things. Uh, also, as with Catherine, I'm not going to do justice to her bio, but Dr. V Dietrich is a familiar face in this area for uh, quite a bit of the crowd, I think, uh, having been in the National Criminal Law Circles for a few years, carrying out multidisciplinary research uh, on issues of international law and international institutions. Uh, she's focused a lot on the intersections of politics and international law, in particular the work of international organizations in the area of international criminal law and, of course, uh, the issue of politics of memory. Uh, she has published on the notions of legacy and the process of legacy building at the International Criminal Tribunals. And Vivian and I uh, go way back to a conference at the University of Pittsburgh. I think there's a participant there, Wes, uh, might have been present for that. We talked about the legacy of the special court many, many years ago now. Uh, Vivian is the deputy director of the Academy and a visiting fellow at the Center for International Studies at the LSC. Uh, previously, she had been an honorary research associate at the Royal Holloway University of London and a visiting researcher at iQuartz in University of Copenhagen. Uh, she has work experience um, both as a staff and intern at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the German Embassy, the Institute of International Education in Washington, D.C., and of course, the U.S. House of Representatives and Bundestag, as well as the German Historical uh, Museum. She holds a PhD from the London School of Economics. Vivian, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening. Thank you for joining us from around the world for this online event. I warmly welcome you on behalf of the International Nuremberg Principles Academy. At the outset, I would like to start with a resounding thank you to the Center for International Law and Policy in Africa, in short SILPA, with its important mandate of building bridges between research, policy and practice. In particular, I would also like to say a personal thank you to Professor Charles Jallo for his timely initiative and his leadership in convening this ICC colloquium series. It is always such a great pleasure working with you, Charles. The Nuremberg Academy has had the privilege of working with the American Society of International Law before and is very pleased to partner once again with um, the society in support of this event series. So thank you, Catherine, to you and the whole team and for the fruitful collaboration together with SILPA. My virtual background is courtroom 600, the very courtroom where the Nuremberg trials were held now 75 years ago. Indeed, anniversaries and commemorative settings provide opportune moments to stimulate further critical reflections, foster ongoing dialogue and deepen our understanding. It is a timely reminder of the importance of prosecuting international crimes, quote, without fear or favor, as prosecutor Fatou Ben Souda has expressed and exhibited time and again. This is the second roundtable discussion of the four-part series. It's an ongoing conversation and we're glad you're joining us today. And it is so important to move just beyond snapshot descriptions or anecdotalism. We have an impressive wealth and breadth of expertise and experience assembled here on the panel. And it is not my intentional place, given our distinguished panel, to attempt any exercise of stock taking in a couple of minutes. Allow me just to share a few remarks. Indeed, the prosecutor is a leading figure in the endeavor of building and strengthening the reputation, the credibility, and the effectiveness of the International Criminal Court. From a practitioner's perspective, introspection is indeed not always easy, but essential. And it is essential with regard to how institutions function, their values, their purposes, their strategies, and policies. Cultivating and bolstering a culture of accountability as well as integrity and independence appears critical to enhance the confidence of the public in the justice institutions and to enhance the upholding of the rule of law. Indeed, the changing political climate deserves particular attention in light of recent back pushback and backlash against international courts and tribunals and a contestation of multilateralism and the rules-based international order that has been palpable. 
the unprecedented decision by the previous US administration to impose economic sanctions on the ICC prosecutor was gravely concerning indeed, and has been seen as an extraordinary assault on international justice. This rightly caused reactions and official statements amongst others by the United Nations, by the court itself, by governments, academia, and civil society. Indeed, the central importance of international law for effective multilateralism and strong international organizations and courts is paramount. And at the ICC, Fatou Ben Souda has shown dedication and determination throughout. Under her leadership, she was reinforced the capacity of her office through a number of strategic and managerial initiatives and expanded the OGP's activities. For example, during her term, there has been a greater focus on gender justice and sexual and gender-based crimes received more visibility. Also heading the OTP, key shifts were made and changes in the organizational climate happened in the office itself. She also set new standards in terms of transparency and dialogue with stakeholders. And of course, these are some of the matters we will be hearing more about in the panel discussion. So in light of the pending completion of Prosecutor Ben Suda's term, there is a burgeoning activity in terms of critical appraisal, stock taking, reflecting on the achievements of the court, of the office, but also reflecting on individual legacies. And indeed, individuals shape an institution as leadership counts. Courts as legacy leavers, including the ICC as a permanent institution, and particular individuals within that institution engage in legacy building, whether purposive or otherwise. The legacies of individuals live on even after any official term is completed. Indeed, legacy formation depends on the engagement of other actors and how legacies are formed, received, acted upon, addressed, commemorated, and continuously constructed. And indeed, legacy construction is an ongoing process, effectively thus undermining the idea that the past exists as an independent and impenetrable from the present and the future. So in this sense, individuals and institutions retroactively become who or what they are said to represent. And this roundtable discussion is, of course, an important piece of the puzzle, touching upon several important key issues. At first glance, it seems legacy formation conventionally appears to be inscribed in a linear conception of time. Yet the legacy process contains the confluence of three temporalities, the past, the present and the future. And this summer, the Nuremberg Academy is publishing a new anthology entitled The Past, Present and Future of the International Criminal Court to be published in the Nuremberg Academy series, which features a piece by Fatou Ben Souda based on her keynote speech at the Nuremberg Forum 2018 with a lucid reflection on the 20th anniversary of the Rome Statute and the successes and challenges faced both by the court and her office thus far. So, as will be the focus of the roundtable discussion today, the prosecutor and the OTP have achieved notable successes, but have also faced considerable setbacks. The achievements are indeed considerable, internal and external challenges of course remain significant. And with the new ICC prosecutor, we will see further dynamics of continuity and renewal. So without further ado, I'd like to Thank you once again. We have a terrific lineup of distinguished panelists who will provide a myriad of perspectives and expert views and explore some of the select key topics sketched. I certainly look forward to a rich discussion. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, uh, Vivian, uh, for those uh, words of welcome. Uh, at this point, I'm just going to say a couple of things and I'm going to turn it over. Uh, to uh, our distinguished uh, panelists and moderator. Uh, so for those I haven't met, my name is Charles Jallo, and I'm the founder of uh, the SILPA, uh, Center for International Law and Policy in Africa. And it's for me great pleasure uh, to be able to convene this ICC series. So I'm grateful uh, to Catherine and Vivian of ISIL and Nuremberg Academies respectively for joining us in this effort. I think this is an important conversation to have. Our principal goal basically as a center is to advance the discourse and build bridges between research policy and practice on issues of international law, uh, particularly uh, as they affect Africa. Uh, obviously, international criminal law is one of our priority research areas uh, developed in part through what we call the Africa ICC research project. Uh, the reason for that interest is obvious. As you all know, African states are today a significant player 
uh, or players uh, when it comes to the work of the International Criminal Court. Uh, so for me, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to have this big and important discussion. I'll just note uh, in passing, if I may, that we had the first event on the ICC prosecutor selection process. Uh, it took us a little bit of time, but we finally now have the uh, panel on uh, YouTube. Um, we hope to have this one on YouTube as well, as well as the subsequent ones for those who are not able to join us at the time that we have. I'm not going to make substantive remarks. Uh, I will just endorse uh, what uh, Vivian has said uh, concerning the role of the Office of the Prosecutor and its importance. Uh, the successes are there at the individual level, but also as an institutional level in terms of the office that's so critical to the work of the court. But on the flip side, of course, we've seen some challenges and criticisms. And I think this panel is going to make an attempt to at least lay out some of the critical questions. Uh, so let me, uh, before I turn it over to our moderator, Ms. Lorraine Smith Van Leen, who will be facilitating the discussion for today and introducing, of course, our distinguished panelists and telling us how the program will run, uh, introduce her. Uh, so Lorraine uh, Smith Van Leen is an international human rights lawyer and dedicated advocate for the rights of victims and women. A former senior prosecutor and parish court judge in Jamaica, Lorraine worked for over seven years as director of the International Bar Association's Hague Office with responsibility for monitoring fair trial issues, legal and policy developments at the ICC. She also worked with Redress as a senior legal advisor covering victims issues at the ICC and in transitional justice contexts in Uganda and Kenya. She has authored numerous reports and academic articles on the ICC, the victims' participation and reparations. In 2019, she was profiled by Atlas, an influential global network over 8,000 women lawyers for her contribution to international law. Lorraine currently works as an independent consultant and is the director of Smith Van Lin Consultancy and founder of Talawa uh, Justice for Women, a non-profit organization dedicated to connecting and equipping women leaders of survival and grassroots organizations from the global south. Lorraine, I'm going to turn it over to you and take it away. Thank you very much, Charles. And thank you so much to um, Center for International Law and Policy in Africa, the American Society for International Law, and the International Nuremberg Principles Academy for organizing this very timely and interesting event, series of events, I should say, on the achievements of the current prosecutor and the challenges that we can expect for the incumbent prosecutor. I would say, and I would, I would be very brief because we have a sterling lineup and I want to jump straight into the discussion. We have a sterling lineup of panelists, but I want to frame the issues that I expect to come out in this discussion a little bit. We are looking at an imminent leadership transition at the OTP. The current prosecutor, Fatou Bensouda, coming to the end of her tenure, not just as prosecutor, but at the end of a long and distinguished career in a leadership role in the OTP since the court's inception. She's passing the baton to Karim Khan, currently UN Special Advisor and Head of UNITAD in a historic, what will be a historic and monumentous transition. The current prosecutor, as has been said, has achieved successes in a very difficult multilateral context, which has come at personal cost to her and some of her senior staff. But her independence and persistence in those circumstances have been unparalleled. But as I think we've all seen from the report of the independent expert review, it has also been said, and she has been criticized for um, operating in a toxic, what can be described as a toxic work environment, not just within her office, but within the court more broadly. So there have been challenges. There have been successes in high profile cases, but there have also been some very high profile losses. That's the discussion that we want to have today. And so we have lined up a really good panel of persons from diverse backgrounds. And I'm going to get straight into introducing them. But before I do, let me just jump in and give some housekeeping. So firstly, we are having what may appear to be a formal discussion, but we want it to be to flow very well in a sort of informal way, which is why we have 
set things up that everybody can basically unmute themselves and ask questions, but at the appropriate time. So what we will start with is three rounds of questions in the first segment to our panelists, and we'll allow our panelists to respond. So we're asking the other participants, please don't ask questions at that stage. You are free to put your questions in the chat and we will um, take those questions at the appropriate time. Just for, I'm sure by now everybody's very familiar with the Zoom platform, but for those who may not be, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a chat function and you will see that you can start typing your questions into the chat. If you click on chat to the left, to the right hand of your screen, you will actually be able to see your name. And in case you accidentally unmute yourself, you can mute yourself. If you don't, then I will help you by muting you. Um, to continue, I think um, just to give a general idea of how we want to do it, the panelists will be open to taking the questions. But if we feel that a question might be appropriate for one panelist or the other, I will be happy to direct it if the question was not directed to a particular panelist. How are we going to look at the issues? The first round of questions will focus internally. So we will look at some of the structural issues within the office of the prosecutor. We'll look at the work culture in that office and the kind of structure that governance structure that was set up in the office. The second round will focus on case selection, prioritization, investigations, and prosecutions. So we'll be looking a little bit more substantively at the core functions of the office of the prosecutor. And finally, we will look more externally. How does the OTP fit and operate within the broader global political context. Those questions, after we've had those initial um, presentations by the panel, and we take your questions, we'll allow the panelists to come back with some final reflections. The idea is not just to look critically and in a complimentary way as well at the current prosecutor's um, role and how she has conducted herself, but to also look ahead at some key recommendations for the incumbent prosecutor. So I'll move quickly to introducing our eminent panel and I'll start with the ladies. I have Sara Kahika Kasande, who is the head of office of the International Center for Transitional Justice in Uganda. She is an advocate of the courts of judicature of Uganda and a transitional justice specialist with over 12 years of experience. Her areas of specialization include international law, transitional justice, gender, and the law. Welcome, Sarah. Talita de Souza Diaz. Talita is the Shaw Foundation Junior Research Fellow in Law at Jesus College, Oxford. She also teaches criminal law and international law and po public policy at Oxford, and her current research focuses on online hate speech. Talita completed her doctorate and master's in law at Oxford and has a Bachelor of Laws degree from the Federal University of Pernambuco in Brazil. She's also a qualified lawyer in Brazil where she worked as an appeals court clerk in criminal law. Alex Whiting is a deputy prosecutor in the Kosovo Specialist Prosecutor's Office in The Hague and is on leave from Harvard Law School where he's a professor of practice. Alex has served previously in the Office of the Prosecutor in the Investigations Division at the International Criminal Court and also at International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. He also served in the US as a federal prosecutor. And last but no, by no means least, we have Professor Kevin John Heller, who is a professor of international law and security at the University of Copenhagen's Center for Military Studies and Professor of Law at the Australian National University. His is an academic, sorry, he is an academic member of Doughty Street Chambers in London, and he serves as a legal advisor to the Military Commission defense team representing Ramzi bin Al-Sheib, one of the defendants in the 9-11 trial. He's also a senior expert for international humanitarian and criminal law for UNITAD in Iraq. 
He is also one of the contributors to the Opinion Jurist blog, a well-respected blog in international law. So welcome to our panelists, and I think that we will jump right in by asking a, you to open with a general question. So let me start again um, with the ladies. I'm, I'm gonna start this time with Talitza. Can you tell me what in your view is one major highlight or achievement of the current prosecutor? And what one thing could she have done better or differently? So thank you so much, Lorraine. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. It's a real pleasure. This is a very timely topic. So uh, I'm glad I'm participating in this discussion. Uh, so in response to your questions, because uh, there are two there. So one highlight for me, and I think that Vivian touched on this in her remarks, is the adoption of the policy paper on sexual and gender-based crimes in 2014, as well as the policy on children. And for me, the policy paper on sexual and gender-based crimes was really important because it adopted a broader understanding of gender and it distinguished between sex and gender. And in particular, in relation to gender, it followed a more social definition of it, of gender as a social construct. And I think that this is really important both in relation to the crimes and in relation to prosecutorial strategies that are gender sensitive. Uh, and I think that there's also a nod to discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation as well in the policy paper and the policy on children. It goes without saying that international crimes have a more significant impact on children. So I think that adopting that policy was really, really important and it reflected itself in the cases and in particular in, in the ongoing case. Uh, now, what she could have done differently, I think that she could have embraced that gender sensitivity, not just embraced, but pushed for a more gender sensitive approach to the OTP's own working practices. As we all know, there have been some serious uh, gender issues, it's discrimination towards women, the work culture is not very favorable to women. I was an intern at the ICC and I felt this there, you know, uh, and I experienced this um, in my own sort of like, I saw this with my own eyes. And so I think that she should have pushed a little bit further for, for a more gender sensitive uh, work environment. Those are my two sort of like remarks, I'd say. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna move to Sarah but you've really raised some very interesting points, which I think will come up in the rest of the discussion. Sarah, similar question yeah. to you. Uh, thank you, Lorraine. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon all. It's a pleasure to join this uh, conversation. And I agree it's timely, so I thank the conveners. Um, to answer the question, I had also thought about the gender strategy and uh, so far the successful prosecution of a, a broad range of sexual and gender-based crimes, uh, giving effect to that. But in addition to that, since uh, Talita has mentioned that, I think the highlight really has been shifting the exclusive gaze on the African continent as uh, the main uh, area for situation countries. And as we know, this has been this was one of the key issues that the court has been criticized for for years, um, recognizing that atrocities were happening in other contexts. Uh, some more grave than uh, those that had occurred on the African continent. However, the court had not taken steps. So initiating um, investigations in Palestine, initiating investigations in Afghanistan and Georgia um, are critical in this regard, demonstrating that the prosecutor um, is exercising her independence and uh, pursuing um, situations where there are atrocities, regardless, of course, of the political dynamics that may make her work difficult. Um, in terms of what could have been done better, um, the court still uh, adopted a selective approach to prosecutions. Um, we've seen that so far it's only been successful in prosecuting and in some cases convicting mid-level perpetrators. Um, and this is something that of course falls short of uh, the own court's commitment to hold those who bear the greatest responsibility or high level perpetrators accountable. So to me, those are the two uh, key issues that I'd like to raise. Thank you. 
Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, Kevin, could you um, would you like to weigh in on that question? Okay. Thank you. Um, and of course, thanks to to all the organizers and my my co-panelists. It really is a, a pleasure to be here. Um, let me start with the good, although Sarah kind of stole it from me. Um, I, I think the best thing that Ben Suda has done is to take the ICC out of Africa. Um, the problem will not completely disappear, of course, until the OTP actually starts prosecuting non-African defendants. But at least we've gone from talking about racism and neocolonialism to anti-Semitism and anti-Americanism. And, and that is progress of a sort. Um, I also think that as part of the ICC's move out of Africa, Ben Suda doesn't get anywhere near enough credit for refusing to open the Comoros investigation. Um, had she opened it, Comoros would have been the first non-African investigation, and I think that would have been an absolute disaster. Uh, the situation was incredibly narrow, and it included only crimes committed by Israel. And Ben Suda rightly insisted that if the ICC was going to get involved in the Israel-Palestine conflict, it needed to take on the situation as a whole. And of course, that's what it's now doing. Um, I think it also had a benefit to, to stay with Comoros for one quick second, that, that she defied the pretrial chamber's very ham-fisted attempt to give itself the final word over which situations the OTP would be able to investigate. And I, I don't wanna get into detail, but basically the judges were trying to force her to refuse to open the investigation on interests of justice, which conveniently would have allowed the pretrial chamber to order her to open the investigation. And by resisting that again and again and again and again, um, she affirmed that prosecutorial discretion means exactly that. It's the discretion of the prosecutor. Um, now quickly, the bad, uh, I think the worst thing that Ben Suda has done as prosecutor is take the ICC out of Africa. Um, and I'm being intentionally provocative and, and, and a little bit facetious, but there have been some, some hiccups along the way. Um, first, I think it was a terrible mistake for Ben Suda to ask the pretrial chamber for a jurisdictional ruling in the Palestine situation. She didn't have to ask for one. Palestine's a state party had referred the situation to the court. She could have simply opened the investigation. She didn't need the pretrial chamber's approval. She didn't need a jurisdictional ruling. And in fact, asking for the ruling had a very important disadvantage, which is it risked derailing the investigation entirely. And it gave Israel and the US time to whip up opposition to the investigation and to Palestine's claim of statehood. And that's kind of indicated by the number of states, including important ICC members like Germany and Australia that submitted amicus briefs on Israel's behalf. And then just to end, the second of example of, of the problems of coming out of Africa is the mess that Ben Suda is bequeathing to her successor. Uh, in the last 18 months alone, she's opened investigations in Afghanistan, Palestine, and Myanmar. Uh, all three of those investigations involve non-member states, two of which the US and Israel are particularly powerful. And of course, she recently announced she intends to open two more investigations before her term ends into Nigeria and Ukraine, uh, thus further alienating another powerful non-member, Russia. Um, there's simply no way that Khan will be able to pursue all of those investigations. Uh, he's gonna have to make some very difficult choices and no matter which investigations he decides to prioritize, of course, he will be roundly criticized for his decisions. Thanks. Well, this is, the discussion has started and I think um, there will be a lot to unpack there, but I'm gonna let Alex um, jump in on and share your thoughts on the question before we move into the substantive discussion as well. Thanks, um, Kevin. Alex? Thank you, Lorraine. Um, and uh, thank you to SOPA and ASOL and the Nuremberg Academy for organizing this. Um, and um, pleasure to be here with my fellow panelists. Um, I think that um, uh, uh, for one of the strong things that Fatou Ben Suda did, um, and, and I think it's right that it's been mentioned that she is finishing a, a long stint at the ICC uh, as deputy prosecutor and now as prosecutor. And for, for all the, 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 the good that she's done and, and the, the you know, difficulties that maybe she's had, um, she has to be congratulated for that because it's an extraordinarily hard place to work. Um, and uh, you know, she has, she has uh, worked there now for, for 18 years and that's, that's a long run. Um, for what she's, for what, what, what are the, um, in addition to what the other panelists have said about the good things she's done, I think a really important thing she did was 
to raise the standards for investigations and prosecutions in terms of evidence. It hasn't been entirely successful. The cases have been uneven in her term in terms of successes, but there is absolutely no question that she recognized that um, the judges were demanding more and that also that the cases at the ICC, and this is this may be particular to the environment there, um, tend not to get stronger after they're indicted, um, which, which happen at other tribunals. They would sometimes improve after indictment. That's not true at the ICC. So it's important that, Kate, that strong cases be brought. Uh, and she raised, raised the standards on the quality of the evidence before cases were brought. Uh, and I think um, that was an important achievement. In terms of um, challenges, I think I would um, echo a little bit what Kevin said, but a, a slightly different spin on it. And that is, I think the um, probably the, the uh, maybe a mistake was not to focus more. Um, and in addition, Kevin has, Kevin has pointed out that the additional situations are particularly challenging and that those are being bequeathed to Kareem Khan. It's also just the, the number of situations now that the OTP is involved in. Um, I don't think that that is um, a recipe for success. It's not sustainable. And I think that one thing that I would imagine Kareem Khan will want to do is, is try to think about how to focus the work of the office. Uh, and that will mean putting, I think, putting some of the investigations that have been open on the shelf uh, while he, he focuses the office on on uh, a small number of them uh, in order to um, succeed. Thanks, Alex. Um, interesting and important. Is I think you can all hear me now, yes. Thank you. Um, no, really interesting discussions too about the importance of more focused investigations, the kind of legacy that, um, or what Kareem Khan will need to deal with. And I'm, I'm gonna deal with some of those issues in much more detail in the second round of questions, but I want to, to head to sort of looking at the internal structure and some of what um, Talita and Sarah alluded to. Um, and I certainly would love to hear from Alex. So we, we just ended with you, but I wanted to start with you on that because you are, apart from Talita, you are the only other person who has sort of that inside view of the OTP and can speak to some of the, the issues that they have internally, the work culture. And so, you know, Kareem will basically inherit a well-established existing office, um, you know, with the staff and structures, governance, governance structures, and so on. The independent expert review report indicates that although there were a number of positives, there have been also, and I think Talita mentioned that, a number of staffing challenges, lack of mobility, oversight gaps, bullying, harassment, I mean, these are things that for any incumbent leader, it will take time to review and update, but he has to virtually hit the ground running. I mean, what do you think that Kareem Khan will need to address quickly in order to build confidence internally and externally? And let me just add here, Alex, um, we're making, the question makes some assumptions that that is the situation. I took this from the IER report but maybe you might want to share just very briefly whether you even agree that there is that, you know, those issues are in fact um, the case at the OTP presently. And if so, what would Khan need to do? Yeah, well, I think, I think there's no question that um, the, um, when Kareem comes in, and, and I'll say, if I can just pause for a moment to say that one thing that I've been struck by since Kareem was um, elected to be the next prosecutor in what was a, a pretty, let's say complicated and somewhat contentious process, there's been a lot of enthusiasm in the community uh, among people who do this work at the tribunals, at the ICC, outside of the ICC about him coming in and a lot of hope for his ability to bring about change. 
Um, and so I think that's a really positive development. There's been a kind of rallying around uh, a hope that he will be able to bring, bring about change. And I think that, I think he will, will, there's no doubt he's going to need to change the culture at the ICC. Um, and, the, and, and I think there's absolutely no question that um, it needs changing. There's just been enough, there's enough, there are enough stories Talita just added to them uh, a moment ago about, about the, the toxic environment, about the, about the, the problems there um, that have to be addressed. And that's obviously, obviously has to be a priority. And I think Kareem will want, I have no doubt that Kareem will come in and signal from the very start that that has to change uh, and there has to be accountability for that from the very start. I would also say that I think that even more beyond that, there needs to be, uh, he needs to think about the culture of the institution. And I would say that the culture, what in, in thinking about the culture, in addition to addressing issues of toxic environment and, and accountability, I think he should also think about how to bring us a, a, a greater sense of urgency to the culture at the ICC. Um, people work very hard there. There's, I, I know them and, and I've worked there, but what is missing now, I think, and maybe it's because it's an established institution, it's a permanent institution, people are there long-term, is a kind of urgency, deadlines, moving quickly, working really hard, you know, pushing. Um, that, that is missing. And, and I, to me, I, I'm now at the third tribunal I've been at, that kind of urgency is essential for, um, for the, these institutions to succeed because they are under-resourced, they're underpowered. you're fighting a very difficult fight. And if the office isn't working on all cylinders all the time, then it just, it just will not succeed in the mission. Uh, and I think the culture, in addition, I think the culture he'll wanna bring in addition to urgency, is accountability not just for behaviors and, and how people are treated, but also accountability for work uh, and bring a greater focus to the work of the office in terms of decision-making and in terms of policy. Um, and then the final thing I'll say, I don't wanna go on too long, is that you said that he's coming in inheriting an established office, established structure. However, it's still a very young, institution and a very new institution. And there's a lot that can be changed. And uh, for example, I think the structure of the office could be changed uh, and that it would be, it would help to achieve some of the urgency, accountability, more efficient uh, and clear decision-making, um, which would also help the focus of the office. Um, that structure is not set in stone. It's in a very complicated, kind of structure, management structure, incredible for such an institution, it's I think overly complicated and that could be changed and streamlined. So there's, while things, certain things are established, there's a lot that can still be changed and revised. Great. Um, Kevin, I want to ask you to wait, thanks Alex, to weigh in on that, on the permanence issue. And, and Alex started to talk about that. Do you feel that there is a sort of you know, too much of a comfort zone that the staff are in that will make it hard for Kareem to really come in and, and shake things up? I do. Uh, and I, I do think my comments follow nicely from Alex's. Um, you know, I, I think we have to recognize that, that personnel matters. Um, you know, Khan is coming in for a little healthy dose of creative destruction. Uh, and if he's going to be able to transform the culture of the, the OTP and, and significantly improve the, the quality of its work, he's going to need to be able to bring in people that have the same commitment to change that he does, and, and particularly at the senior levels. Um, the choice of the deputy prosecutor will obviously be a very critical one. Uh, and I think it's great that, that Kareem has made a, a Biden-esque commitment to appointing a woman to the position. Um, everyone recognizes the need for additional gender diversity uh, on a variety of levels. Um, but that's not enough. And I, and I think we have to be honest, <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm somewhat known for that, um, and say that the heads of the various divisions in the OTP have simply been there too long, um, and something needs to be done about that. Um, the head of the investigation division has been in the position for 15 years since LMO's Mourinho Ocampo's third year in office. 
Uh, the head of the Jurisdiction Complementarity and Cooperation Division has been in the position for 10 years. And he's been at the court literally since day one. Uh, and then the head of the Prosecution Division has been in the position for seven years and has been in the OTP for 17. Now that's not a criticism of those men, uh, and they are all men, which is itself somewhat problematic, um, to say that it's time for some new blood. Uh, and that's true for the OTP senior staff as a whole. I was, I was very struck by the independent expert review statistics that said 44% of D1 staff and 23% of P5s have been at the court for more than a decade. That's a long time in a, more than half of the court's existence. But it's very difficult to replace individuals in senior OTP positions. So I really uh, endorse the, the independent expert reviews uh, suggestion that a tenure system be adopted. Um, I think it, I disagree with the review in that it shouldn't be applied to just new hires. I think it should be applied to all staff, current and future, even if doing so will ruffle a few feathers. Uh, we need to ensure that Khan can at some point during his nine years really have the senior staff that reflects his vision. Um, I also think the OTP needs to hire better <laughs> at all levels. Now, there's a number of excellent lawyers in the office. We should take Rod Rastin and we should clone him as many times as we possibly can. Um, but there's also a lot of mediocre ones. Uh, and everyone I know has a story of some amazing person who was not hired by the OTP who then went on to get a fantastic job elsewhere. Um, one of the best students I've ever taught in my 16 years, a, a very successful criminal lawyer in her own country who had also been an international prosecutor, uh, she interviewed for four P1 and P2 positions with the OTP in the space of a year. Uh, she was never hired. And then six months later, she was offered a P4 position at a different international criminal tribunal. So I don't know exactly what's wrong with the interview process because I've never been privy to it, but I think something is broken. Um, and then finally, I'll just end by noting that the independent expert review has a lot of really good suggestions for how the OTP can increase the number and quality of its personnel without actually needing a larger budget, which I know is something that we're also gonna talk about. Um, they talk about encouraging member states to, to lend prosecutors and investigators and analysts to the OTP. Now they say that the secondments usually reflect state desires and not OTP needs. Well, I think that should be switched around. The OTP should seek out personnel that it needs and encourage both the Global South and Global South st North states to contribute people. They mention relying on the UN Interagency Mobility Agreement to borrow staff from UN agencies, particularly the better funded ones. That's a good idea. And then they also say that we should be encouraging NGOs and universities to lend experts to the court to work on specific situations, cases, and projects. Now, none of those are a substitute for the OTP being able to hire more people. We all want that to be the case. But until the ASP increases its budget, Khan is going to have to be creative to get the, the people that he needs to accomplish the ends that he sets for the office. Thanks, Kevin. I, I'm, I'm looking at the time, but these are important discussions and we haven't even touched the meat. Talita, is it only an internal problem? I mean, we've heard from Alex and Kevin, but there are some budget issues here. The fact is the, the independent expert review said they, there isn't enough budget. The, I, the, in, in the investigations division is short staff, critically short staff. I mean, how, how are we gonna get over that hurdle? Is it just FATU that was at fault or is it that states who are supposed to be supporting the court aren't? So uh, I, first of all, I agree with everything that Kevin uh, said. Um, I think that the prosecutor, the new prosecutor has to be creative in, in you know, addressing the shortage of budget. But I also think that, uh, of course, it's, it's the fault, it's not for two's fault if they don't have enough money because money comes from the ASP. She just has to, you know, deal with whatever she gets from it. But I think it's a reality, right? It's a reality and especially now with the pandemic where resources are going to healthcare and that's just the reasonable uh, course of action to take. And so we have to deal with it, you know, and everybody, all parties involved, the ASB, the prosecutor, they have to deal with the reality of short budget. And so I think that as Alex said, uh, the prosecutor, he must use his discretion wisely to select and prioritize the most feasible cases and situations. They can't just prosecute and investigate all of those situations that are now within, you know, the, the, 
the scope of the court that are now within the preview of the court. There has to be a selection. Some of these investigations that have to be shelved, they have to be shut down. It's just what it is and there's nothing we can do about it. The ICC as any other international institution and even domestic institution, they have to navigate in this environment of politics and especially for an international institution. Um, but I think that in terms of selecting cases, I think that um, he needs to be guided Alita, by evidence, right? I'm yeah, going to jump in and stop you now because the, the selection of cases is something I really want yeah, to I know, talk I know. Back ahead of. This. So I'm going to just Okay, so I will, I'll address it later. Great, thank you. I, I wanted to, to get, because that's one of those big substantive areas, but I also wanted to touch a little bit, Sarah, on another aspect of this sort of structural working method of the, of the Office of the Prosecutor, and that is how they engage with people in the field. And so, for example, one of the criticisms of the IER is that they don't have enough field-based or persons with, I should say, um, persons with contextual knowledge and experience, the people who are from situation countries who could be seconded goes back to what Kevin said. I wanted to hear your thoughts as somebody who is actually in one of the situation countries. Thank you, thank you, Lorraine. Um, this has been an area where, uh, which has been shot. However, we've noticed some limited uh, improvement uh, over the years. Because I remember when the ICC began its uh, operations in Uganda, it had a very limited field presence and it still has a very limited field presence and a few local staff. However, over the years, uh, they've tried to address this by recruiting local staff. We have uh, Ugandan staff in the outreach, in the VPRS, and also in the OTP as well. However, they still maintain a very limited uh, field presence, which limits their ability to engage substantively or have a lasting impact in the situation country. Um, even in terms of outreach, because of the limited field presence, they need to engage effectively with so civil society who do quite um, a significant amount of work to, in terms of uh, getting information uh, out there. But also the limited field presence affects their ability to engage with other processes. For instance, the transitional justice processes that are ongoing in the country. Um, and this is mainly due because they really don't have the staff. They don't have the capacity. They are unable to engage in these conversations. And I think this affects the impact of the court because there should be that cross engagement where the court's interventions, the prosecutions form part of a broader accountability transitional justice framework um, of the country. However, as I said, um, even with the limited staff, we've seen um, some level of improvement in community, communicating with uh, affected communities, providing information to victims, and also um, uh, in Uganda, for instance, the screening whereby over 20 locations in uh, various case locations and making sure that this is transmitted in local languages. So that has uh, been useful. But again, the court needs to uh, strengthen its field presence, hire more local staff and also those who are international engage in training and see that there's a connection with the, of the current uh, processes that are underway in the country. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, I think, I, I, and Talita, sorry for interrupting you earlier, but I am ready for us to jump in very quickly to this um, case selection and prioritization issue that I, and the, the need for more focused investigations. I, I want to start with you because um, you were about to get involved in, in that discussion already and I know it's, it's a burning issue. So let me ask you this. We've all seen and I think most of us have read the prosecutor's um, strategic plan for 2019 to 2021 which you know, the new prosecutor will obviously have to, to decide what his strategy will be. But the IER also talked about, they had several concerns about the approach of the current prosecutor to um, case selection and prioritization. They noted specifically that there was a lack of transparency and certainty over the criteria used during various stages of case of situation and case selection and prioritization as well as concerns that the OTP's limited resources 
were being spent on situations with little prospect of success. To address those issues, they propose that the prosecutor should take into account feasibility at the stage of selecting or prioritizing situations for preliminary examinations and cases for prosecution, but not when deciding whether or not to proceed with an investigation under Article 53.1. Now, Talita, I would really welcome hearing your thoughts on this. And this is one of those issues that I will open for Sarah, Alex, or Kevin to also just very quickly add your thoughts here, because I see this as a, as a really important issue. Yeah. Talita. And a hot topic. No, the reason, why topic. I <laughs> the reason why I raised it earlier is because budget is intrinsically related to this, to feasibility. It's actually one of the, the one criterion for feasibility, for assessing feasibility, so the prospects of success of a case. So basically, I, I, I disagree to some extent with this finding of the IER, uh, because I think that uh, to some extent, the same uh, nature, the same type of discretion, the same types of discretionary factors, they play out both in the preliminary examination stage, the investigation, like prior to the investigation stage and prior to the prosecution stage. So prosecutorial discretion, you know, it's, it's informed by a number of factors. One of these factors is of course feasibility, which includes security on the ground, you know, protection of staff, protection of witnesses, the availability of sufficient evidence, which in turn depends on state cooperation, budget, you know, you can only do so much with the money that you've given uh, and the prospects of securing the accused. So all of these things together with, you know, more legal criteria like the, the gravity of the crime, uh, whether the degree of participation of, of the individuals potentially accused. So all of these things inform any prosecutorial decision. And I think that they inform any decision at any stage. And they're just the reality. These decisions are already being made at the preliminary examination stage, at the select that stage, at the selection of uh, preliminary examinations for investigations, and at the selection and prioritization of investigations for prosecution of specific cases. The thing is uh, that uh, the the if the prosecutor does not raise these factors explicitly, then we're going to have this continuous lack of transparency, which is why I think that the prosecutor should invoke those criteria more transparently, right? And there is an avenue for doing that. I mean, the, the, there is the, you know, as you've, as you've mentioned, the prosecutorial strategies, they, there is mention of some of these criteria, but not in the context of investigations and prosecutions. But actually, if you look at the statute and act, uh, and you've mentioned Article 53.1, the interest of justice is one of those legal provisions which provides the prosecutor with, you know, a significant amount of discretion to consider those factors. And the importance of raising these issues in the context of the, the interest of justice test is that it, it gives more transparency to these decisions and it allows the court to examine, to review those decisions. So this is what I think. I think there's great discretion in all these stages a number of factors are involved. The reality is that there is no there's no running away from this. And, you know, it's just a question of being more transparent about this. And I'm happy to elaborate on this uh, later on in the Q&A. But that's what I think. Of course, the degree of discretion varies as one progresses uh, with a case. But the nature of the, dis the discretion, the factors are roughly the same. Yeah, thanks, um, Talita. I, I think this is definitely something I hope we can explore more during the discussion phase, but I, I would really like to hear from you, Alex, on this, because I know you've, you've written an article and you have some thoughts around, around this. Can you just, I don't know if you want to directly comment on what Talita has said, or just share your broader views concerning um, the, the, you know, the approach, the current approach to case selection and prioritization. You hinted at it in your opening remarks, but it would be very interesting to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, thank you. And I, I largely agree with what Talita has said. Um, I, I, I think, um, so for me, the, 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 the court in focusing has to not just focus on, you know, investigations and cases, but also on what its core mission is. And to me, its core mission is cases. It, 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 if it has, if it, and case, and by cases, I mean people who are charged and brought to the Hague and prosecuted in the Hague. 
if the courtrooms have cases, um, that's a success. If the courtrooms are empty, that's a failure. I mean, that's the starting point. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of other things that the court does, but it's all, it's all of it starts with cases. And for that reason, I agree with what Talita has said that, that feasibility um, really has to be, it, it has been, and it ha has to continue to be a factor in choosing preliminary examinations, investigations, and cases. Now there is resistance to that sometimes because people think, well, then you're going to you're just doing the easy cases, you're not doing the hard cases. Um, there's a there's a his, there's a narrative in this in this world that oh you know certain people were charged and nobody ever thought that they would get to the Hague and then they did and so if you just charge them maybe they will, but but that narrative only goes so far and. Um, and the reality is just like there's a budget reality, there's also a power reality for the International Criminal Court. And however much you know, people might like the court to bring cases you know, that, are, that are the really hard cases or against the really hard people, if those cases don't succeed, the court doesn't succeed. Um, and so I think, I think that the prosecutor has to think about, about where what what investigations are going to result in cases. Now, I, I just want to say one last thing, if I can, about the transparency point. Obviously, everyone like transparency is a thing is like it seems like a good that everybody wants, right? Like transparency is always a good thing. And I and I'm not going to argue against transparency. However, I will say that it's often very complicated in terms of these how these decisions get made and what criteria are relied on. It's often not a simple thing. It's often a, 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 a variety of factors that are at play. There can be even different people in different offices. And I think that um, while the office should be as transparent as possible, there also has to be, in my view, a kind of deference to the prosecutor in making these decisions. And if we get into a situation where this is all being reviewed by the court that I don't think that the judges are well positioned to do that. And I don't think that's healthy for the court. I see that Talita is nodding her head. So I'm, I'm absolutely, I agree. The discretion is of the prosecutor, not the chambers. Well, here, this, here, is, here. this is why <laughs> we kind of even have a discussion amongst ourselves as panelists, but let's it's, I'm sure it will come back because I, I would love to hear either Sarah or Kevin. Let me start with Kevin on this because both on, on the issue of um, the need for more focused cases. Uh, You're muted, Lorraine. It is wonderful that as a, as a moderator, I'm going in and out of mute, but my point, well, my question was to Kevin, your thoughts on the issue of um, feasibility and the and, and transparency, because I think this, this issue, I had some thoughts also about what transparency also means. And <laughs> Kevin, can I just hear your thoughts quickly on that? Sure, and, and they can be very brief because I, I, I strongly agree with my, you know, the two speakers before me. Um, you know, feasibility, it kind of it beggars belief that there was actually years at the ICC where the official position of the OTP was that we don't take into account feasibility of investigation. I mean, that was crazy. If you can't prove that people are guilty, why do you prosecute them? Um, that just seemed obvious. And I think Ben Suda has done a much better job with that. Um, but I also really want to echo what Alex said about transparency, that the transparency is not good in and of itself. It has to it has to be there for a reason. And, you know, and, and I think part of the kind of own goals of the OTP has been too much transparency. You know, I praised them for the Comoros decision earlier. All of that was started was because they published a 60 page explanation for why they weren't going to investigate the situation. Didn't have to do that. All they did was give 60 pages of arguments to the pretrial chamber to then turn against them. 
you know, if we're going to have prosecutorial discretion, as exactly as Alex and Talita said, we have to trust that we have the right people that are going to make the right decisions. Doesn't mean that they can't give us a window into their thinking, but they shouldn't have to justify every single prosecution decision that they make, because that's just a recipe for, you know, uh, other organs meddling in their core responsibilities. Well, let me ask, um... Let me ask you, Kevin, as a follow on to that, you mentioned Palestine in your opening remark. Um, and you said basically the prosecutor shouldn't have gone ahead and, and you know, asked the, the pretrial chamber to assess the issue of jurisdiction. I wondered, what, what do you think um, this, I think this was also partially not just a jurisdictional question, but also in the interest of quote unquote, not just transparency, but you know, to, to say I've looked at all sides, but you see, you disagreed very strongly with it. What do you see as the impact of her deciding to do that? You mentioned it before, but I would love for you to sort of link that to the discussion we're now having in terms of how she's to approach these issues, well, how I she has approached. I can be quick on this too. I mean, you know, I, I think it was the worst of all possible worlds to ask for the jurisdictional ruling. Um, I mentioned before that part of the downside was it just gave Israel opportunity to, to muster opposition to the court. Um, it also, you know, she could have just basically made Israel wait <laughs> to either file an Article 18 request for deferral, which we know with the passage of time they weren't going to do, or wait till an actual summons or arrest warrant was issued and then let them challenge complementarity. But it, 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 she lost all of those advantages by seeking this ruling. And then the, the, the flip side of it is, you know, the justification was, well, it's such an important question and so controversial, we need a firm jurisdictional basis. We don't have that. We have an opinion by the pretrial chamber. <laughs> the pretrial chamber is not the final word on legal issues of the Rome Statute. It is the appeals chamber. All of the issues that we spent all of this time litigating at the pretrial chamber will come back again when there is actual charges being brought, if ever, against an Israeli defendant. The pretrial chamber acknowledges that they're not the final word on this. So we've lost a year. We've allowed diplomatic initiatives to gain speed. And we still don't have the legal resolution that might possibly have been an advantage of seeking this ruling in the first place. So, so that's why I say this was the worst of all possible worlds for the Office of the Prosecutor. Um, Sarah, thanks, thanks, Kevin. Sarah, let me ask you, maybe you want to weigh in on this transparency issue. Um, tell me if you want to, I don't know what your thoughts are about whether you see that the prosecution needs to be more focused in terms of her investigations and whether the, the level of um, what Talita mentioned, the need for that level of transparency. What are your thoughts around this, this discussion? Thank you, Lorraine. Um, I agree with Talita and I do agree that there is a need for a level of transparency, um, especially in uh, situations where the prosecutor clearly uh, undertakes investigations and issues warrants against a particular group. Um, because this really sends, um, has an effect in that particular situation country. And we've seen that uh, in situation countries, Uganda, Cote d'Ivoire, Central African Republic, where the prosecutor's uh, care selection and decision to investigate have targeted a particular um, uh, group, a particular side uh, that's committed atrocities, no doubt that it's committed atrocities, but this contributes to shaping a narrative. And we've seen that uh, in instances where the prosecutor has been put to task to explain uh, why, uh, for instance, investigations in Uganda or Cote d'Ivoire have only so far targeted one side, uh, they have not been forthcoming with that explanation. And this um, has political implications. One, it shapes the narrative in that particular context about who uh, the individuals who are responsible, but also the failure to share information. If they say, if the prosecutor says that the investigations did not um, reveal uh, uh, violation of crimes of a threshold um, as set in the Rome Statute, then the prosecutor should reveal the information that's been uh, obtained to enable, if possible, domestic prosecutions or complementarity efforts uh, for that matter. But this hasn't been the case, and instead it has fueled further suspicions about the court's role in that particular context, but it has also fed 
into um, giving uh, particular groups that uh, wield power currently, uh, Alex uh, mentioned the power dynamic, uh, given them an opportunity to um, evade accountability and entrench themselves. So I think transparency is uh, critical in the prosecutor's uh, decision to select cases. And I think it's important to also acknowledge that indeed these power uh, dynamics affect uh, uh, abil the ability of the prosecutor to effectively investigate or have feasible cases. So I agree that transparency should be prioritized. Interesting. Thanks, Sarah. I mean, Alex did say that it's complex. So um, I, but I, I anticipated that in the Uganda context and Cote d'Ivoire, this, this would have been your response. I want to open things out a little bit, though, and look at the court's um, position in, in, and the OTP's position in sort of the broader global context. And I think it's a, it's a good place to follow on because what we've also heard when we're talking about transparency and feasibility, I think it, it, it brings up another question of the importance of the, the context in which this the OTP and the court in general is operating. So let me, let me ask, um, let me start with you, Kevin. Um, we've seen the, the pushback against the prosecutor um, in relation to, yeah, from one of the, 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 the world powers from the US. And um, that fact Ben Sura personally had a particularly difficult time under the previous US administration because of unfairly imposed sanctions. But they've now been rolled back under the new president. Seems to be a positive development, but has the tide fully turned for the ICC US relationship? And at a diplomatic and strategic level, how do you think the new prosecutor should engage with the US? Well, I, I think we, we need to, to start by acknowledging that the, the tide will never fully turn in terms of getting the US to support the court. Uh, it, you know, as I've said many times, skepticism of the ICC is one of the few truly bipartisan positions in the United States. Um, but that said, obviously Biden's election does mark a very welcome return to kind of more pragmatic engagement with the ICC. I mean, clearly the Biden administration, unlike its predecessor, will be willing to cooperate with the ICC when there are, you know, when there is an alignment of interests between the court and the United States. Um, and so I think part of the thing that, that Kareem Khan needs to do is constantly remind the US that there are situations in which they have an interest in working together. Uh, you know, Georgia and the Ukraine are, are very obvious ones with, with Russia's involvement. Uh, Myanmar, I mean, the, the US has been kind of admirably at the front of, of sanctioning, uh, you know, the, the junta. Um, those are very ripe for, for cooperation. Um, but the prosecutor also has to hold his ground uh, on the Afghanistan and Palestine situations. You know, he can't give in to U.S. pressure, uh, even though it's obviously going to complicate the OTP's investigation. And as part of this, I, I think, forgive me for the way I'm putting this, you know, he needs to kind of constantly explain to the U.S. government and the U.S. media how the ICC actually works. Um, you know, there's nothing more frustrating than reading a, a government statement or an article that claims that the, you know, quote, the OTP opened an investigation into U.S. crimes in Afghanistan, you know, as if the Taliban and the Afghan military didn't exist, or, you know, reading statements and articles the claim that the OTP can't investigate the CIA because the US has a functioning judicial system, you know, as if that's actually what the principle of complementarity requires. Um, you know, it may not actually sway the US, but at least it could help, you know, um, countries that might be willing to, to go along with the US, maybe give it a little bit of second thought about some of the, the, the ways that the, the US is approaching the court. Um, and then just very finally, you know, I think the, the prosecutor also can't give in to the US's critics either. You know, he can't charge Americans just for the sake of charging Americans. Uh, you know, he needs to charge the individuals who've committed the most serious crimes and the crimes that he can prove the easiest. And in Afghanistan, that may well mean charging the Taliban uh, and perhaps even members of the Afghan military before charging a CIA torturer. You know, he needs to develop a prosecutorial program that works for the OTP doesn't work for the critics of the United States. That's all. Thanks, Kevin. 
And and to follow on from from that point, um, just mindful that we want to jump in to bring in some of the participants into the discussion. I wanted to ask Alex, um, talking about political context and the U.S. Um, the prosecutor should be commended. I mean, for for you know standing her ground in relation to Afghanistan, and we have her also in in you know another sort of politically charged context in Palestine. What do you see as some of the, the challenges that will now face um, the incumbent prosecutor in light of you know, these two very politically charged situations? Well, I mean, those are difficult for Kareem, right? The Afghanistan and Palestine. And I think that, um, uh, I think that he has to walk a careful path um, because on the one hand, there is, you know, a, a, a judicial institution has to be even handed and it has to apply the law and it, and it has to be perceived as doing so. And on the other hand, we have all just been talking, all of us about, about feasibility and the importance of doing cases and succeeding. Um, and I think uh that is the priority for for me i would tilt on that side that's the priority for the court uh in a, in a, in afghanistan um you know i i think there are both there are pragmatic reasons and also gravity reasons to focus on the crimes of the taliban and perhaps of the afghan government um and um I don't know how he's going to manage in the situation in Palestine. But if we want, you know, here's here's a, a, an interesting question about, well, let me just say this. I think it's, I don't see a good outcome for the ICC if it tries to take on cases uh, uh, against the US and, Afghan and Afghanistan or take or start to charge cases in the Palestine situation. I don't see the ICC being the winner in that. Um, I, uh, the, you know, some people have argued that just by opening those situations, by taking on those powers, the ICC is a winner. I don't see it that way. Uh, I think that if the, if the ICC takes those on and loses, which it will, uh, the ICC loses. It, there's no victory in defeat in this case. And um, I, as I said, I think the ICC the ICC has to focus on its core mission, which is in bringing cases, and it has to find ways to bring cases. Um, standing up to governments and and faltering and losing um, is not doesn't um, progress that that mission. Um, and so I think that the I think that um, you know Kareem can't come in and just shut down those investigations, but I think through a prioritization process. Um, he can um, focus the court on places where it can actually achieve its mission. And here, there's an interesting question about transparency, right? To go back to what we were talking about before, how transparent should the prosecutor be about, about, about uh, prioritization focus? So should the prosecutor announce, well, I'm, I'm, I'm only going to focus on Taliban crimes. I'm not going to focus on crimes in the US, or, or I'm not going to do anything in Palestine and I'm going to focus on other situations um, or or should the prosecutors just do that without announcing it I think that's not an easy that's not an easy question to answer so it isn't it, it isn't and I, I wonder if Talita you want to, to jump in on that I mean there was an article by uh, Mark Harrison that said basically, this, the issue is not just about um, political, the prosecutorial discretion. It's, it's easy to say the prosecutor is independent and she can exercise her discretion, but it's also what he describes is a case of political, of, of prosecutorial op opportunism because the, the office of the prosecutor operates in a political context. So, I wonder whether you would want to comment on what Alex said, because is it a question that, um, you know, Fatu, you know, just it wasn't just a question of her exercising her discretion, but also being she had to be mindful of the context in which she was operating. 
Is this a basis for saying, you know, I'm going to back down because this case could have very serious implications? I mean, Alex says he doesn't sound very hopeful for the, the, <laughs> the Afghanistan case. And I'm, I'm just, I would just love to hear your thoughts. And Sarah, if you want to, to, to jump in, you let me know as well. And, and Kevin, too, we have a few more minutes. And this is an important one. Talita? So, uh, so just on the transparency point very quickly, just, I know it's a difficult one to, to know how much transparency is needed. What, I mean, 60 pages, 10 pages, how many pages, how specific should one be in justifying why they're going forward with an investigation or a prosecution and why are they not going forward? But I think that at the very least, on a very general level, the first step is for the prosecutor to acknowledge that these factors, the politics, the budget, all of these things are part and parcel of discretion in any legal system. And it's it's just the reality. Any tribunal works in a political environment. Any, I mean, there's more or less, you know, uh, discretion in some systems, but the, the reality is the same. And the same goes for the ad hoc tribunals. Uh, and Nuremberg, for that matter, they all needed a, a favorable political environment to thrive. And I think that acknowledging this, at least on a very general level, without giving the, 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 the specifics for each and every case, each and every situation, that would be a, a good first step. And then, you know, uh, the prosecutor can see how that leads, how that, how that you know, turns out for him and, and, and the response to this level of transparency. Now, um, going back to the issue of constraints and politics, as I said, I think that they are part and parcel of discretion, either for prioritization, either for selection, they're, they're part of, of, of any prosecutor's decision. And I think that one thing that we need to bear in mind, and this is a broader question here, is that the fact that the ICC, and I agree with Alex that I'm not very hopeful about Palestine and Afghanistan, um, not, not because I don't think that the, the, the situations are serious, they are very serious, but it's just the question of, you know, being realistic about the chances of success. But as I said, the broader question here is that the ICC is not a universal court. It's not going to save the world. It's not, the, it's not a panacea for all crimes and all atrocities in the world. And we need to stop thinking about it in, in that way. And we need to stop demanding so much of it because if so, it's bound to failure. And so we need to have more modest expectations about what the ICC can do and what the ICC should be doing. And we need to be boosting or talking more about other mechanisms to bring justice to these situations. I mean, there's so much more than we can do. There's reparations, there's prevention, which is more important than cure. So there are a lot more things that we can be doing rather than just, you know, blaming the ICC or putting a lot of hope in the ICC. It's just one piece of the puzzle, the bigger puzzle of international criminal justice, in my view. So that's, that's what I think. I'm not like pessimistic, but I think that there are other avenues for addressing these situations as well as other situations. Mm -hmm. Now, thanks, um, Talita. I think one of the things that I would love to open up for discussion after, um, after I let Sarah go, but I really would love to unpack a little bit more and to hear from, from the panelists about this issue of what it really means when we're talking, when, when the prosecutor is said to be supposed to have more focused um, investigations. Um, in, in, in the context that we are talking about here, are we saying that she is not to, or the incumbent is not to consider um, prosecutions when there is very little likelihood of success? And we're mindful, I think, of the Afghanistan appeal and what the appeals chamber said in that case. But what does that translate to in real terms when there is also pressure coming from, you know, the public pressure on these issues? So it would be really interesting to me to have a, a, a broader discussion on that. But I'm just gonna jump to Sarah very quickly so that we can wrap up the, the 
panelist section and then open things up for broader discussion. And I'd like to invite the other participants to please start typing your questions into the chat um, on any of the issues that we've already raised. Sarah, you know, you've heard about the sort of political context that the court is operating in and the Afghanistan and, and Palestine situation, but you're, we're also dealing with an incumbent prosecutor who is not African. And I know the court has shifted some of its focus from Africa, but there are still open um, cases and preliminary examinations in on the continent. And Fatou Ben Souda should be credited for really trying to work hard and as an African to engage um, regional organizations like the AU. But what do you think are some of the key lessons that can be learned by the incoming prosecutor from the court's engagement in Africa? And what do you see as some of the remaining pressing priorities in the region that the incoming prosecutor will need to urgently deal with? Uh, thank you, Lorraine. Thank you. And uh, just to build on what uh, the previous panelists have also mentioned is it really demonstrates that uh, interaction with the court is by states, uh, it doesn't matter whether the states are in the African continent or in the Western sphere, it's really influenced by self-interest. And uh, that's why um, in the early years of the court, we saw this uh, tenuous relationship between the court and uh, the African Union and its member states. Now we see there's been that change whereby um, the relationship with, between the ICC and the AU has improved. Uh, we've seen uh, plans for mass withdrawal uh, dose. And instead we've now seen this new dynamic whereby it's the US and uh, the, the ICC that are engaged in this um, uh, unfortunate uh, interaction regarding uh, limiting the court's operations. But nevertheless, I think um, there are lessons from, uh, from what, how the African situation, the engagement between the AU and the African situation has resolved itself, but I think there's still more room uh, for that. And one is building trust and regular communication. And as you noted, um, the current prosecutor has made an effort to engage with the AU to regularly reach out. Um, there have been interactions with the Office of Legal Counsel. And of course, uh, it helps that uh, the court has now opened situations in other continents other than Africa and therefore trying to limit uh, those uh, criticisms. But engaging and sharing information, but having an honest uh, conversation about the power dynamics um, that affect the court's relationship with the AU member states and the AU itself. And I guess it's also quite important that, uh, uh, of course, with the, the toppling of Bashir, we've now seen that Sudanese government has entered into an MOU with the ICC to cooperate. Sudan is a non-state party, and for years there's been that debate, how can the ICC have jurisdiction of a non-state party? And this has been a matter that's been litigated in all these uh, in a number of cases, but we've seen that there's been an improvement in that area, but still there's need for dialogue, there's need for greater collaboration. And I think it shouldn't just be the onus on the ICC, but also the African Union. Um, I was particularly concerned, for example, in the African Union's African Transitional Justice uh, Policy Framework, um, the element that looks at accountability and justice, there's no mention on how that interacts or how states or, or recognition of the ICC as a player in that space. So there's importance that both institutions really um, prioritize uh, collaboration because that's the only way uh, that they would uh, pursue accountability. And I think uh, tying to that is the ICC's understanding of complementarity and looking at not just the role of regional organizations, but also regional courts. I know, of course, uh, the Malabo Court Protocol was a politically motivated process, but it does um, represent, uh, to a certain extent, an effort possibly to see how to close the impunity gap, especially where states are unable, where the ICC jurisdiction is limited. And those are conversations that I believe that the new prosecutor will have to take forward. And um, secondly, um, if you permit me, Lorraine, the new prosecutor uh, comes into office after a heavily contested process. And this time it's not just to the AU, but with civil society. 
uh, we've seen um, civil society actors, a section of civil society actors on the continent who are critical of the process and his uh, election. So I think uh, he has a, a big responsibility to see how to rebuild those relationships while obviously asserting the independence of the, of the office because the OTP cannot succeed in any situation country without um, the close uh, support of civil society actors who obviously bridge the gap, both uh, in terms of the geographic, but also the cultural um, divide between the court and this context. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for those really important remarks and remind us too about um, the, the regional and stakeholder engagement that the, the new prosecutor will have to, um, to put in place and will have to pay attention to. And thank you to all the panelists for a very engaging debate so far. Um, you've raised a number of issues. I think some of the things that were jumping out, um, the issue of feasibility um, in relation to ca the case selection and prioritization process and preliminary examinations. We've seen um, the question of transparency come up. How much is too much? How much should be said? And, and, and publicly revealed um, by the prosecutor. Um, we've, we've heard, I think, also about some of the, what, what the panelists saw as failures in terms of the approach that the prosecutor, the, the current prosecutor took. Um, for example, um, as was mentioned, I think by Kevin, in relation to the Palestine um, situation. So I wonder whether um, we have already any questions in the chat, but it is now open to the rest of the participants. And I see some hands already going up. This is really exciting. So I'm going Karen, to- there are, a, there are just a couple of questions already. I think that they've- already Okay, asked let me yeah, just have a- I could, I could jump in on some of those questions. I have some things to say about a couple of the questions in the chat. Fantastic. Wait, let, let me have a look because this is, this is I am expecting, I, I made sure to leave enough time and I'm expecting- There's a some great, great questions. Discussion. Could I just ask, um, I see already two hands, but I'm gonna go with the first questions. Um, just a minute. Okay, so it's coming up in the chat. Um, there are quite a few here. So I, I think it's already been answered about the, so I'll start with the one from Liz Evenson from Human Rights Watch. Um, so Liz, if you are on, I can actually just have you pose the question, but I'll just, um, if you're still on, but I'll just read it through very quickly. She says she wants to press back on some of the suggestions that we just need to accept the limits of the ICC. While there are political and budgetary realities and the ICC is indeed only a court of last resort, to what extent are these realities set in stone and to what extent could they be shifted? So for example, could a higher performing OTP elicit more support? Could or should ICC states parties be pressed to support concrete investigations and prosecutions rather than the assembly's current practice, which is largely to treat the court's work in the abstract to avoid calling out potential or actual non-cooperation? Rather than lose ambitions for the system, can we collectively redouble efforts to meet them? So Alex, was it one of those that you wanted to yes. jump in on? I would love I to answer that. I would love to answer that question, and and I'm glad that Liz asked that question. Liz is Liz is one of the most eloquent and strongest advocates of this this view of the ICC, and and it's an important it's an important perspective. And I and I and um, there's some days I wish I could fully embrace it, but I think that you, you know because I it's it, it's important to be you know, ambitious and hopeful for the court. And this, this, this field has succeeded because of dreams and ambition. But I am really persuaded that um, the way the court will succeed is only by having cases and by proving that it can function and building up a steady, um, a steady track record 
of cases. And, for, and to do that, it has to be pragmatic. The reality is just that the court is a weak institution. It's, it was intentionally designed that way. Um, uh, it was intentionally designed that way at the height of, of kind of euphoria about this field and about the possibility of international criminal law. And now we're much further away from that. And, and, and states are not going to be um, shamed or persuaded or cajoled or called out to give a lot more money or a lot more cooperation. We should keep fighting that fight and keep talking about that, but that is not the path to success. That's not going to happen in the short term. The only way that states are going to be persuaded is if the court works and their precedents and the, with, with each precedent is a pressure point on, on states because when, when somebody gets convicted, then that gives a voice to other people to say, look, the, the people get convicted for these crimes. Why don't I have justice for my crimes? So it is, it, it is that the cases, the successes of the court is what will build momentum and pressure on the states. And that is the only thing I think that will work. So I, 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 Liz's voice and her work is super important, but I think that the court has got to really be pragmatic in this way to, um, to, to do its work and to succeed. Thanks, Alex. Um, Kevin, I see your hand up. You want to respond to that question as well? Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I think probably what bodes the most ill for the court is the fact that Alex and I seem to agree about everything, which was, was certainly not always the case. Um, you know, I, I, I want to echo what he said in, in response to Liz. And, and I do think, you know, at a kind of a granular level, if the court could kind of get some more convictions, it probably could get a little bit more cooperation and a little bit more budget. I mean, you know, nothing breeds success like success, as the saying goes. But I also think we really, we don't have to accept the limitations of the court, but we have to be aware of them and not sugarcoat them. There are some really, as kind of Alex hinted at, there are some really important structural limitations on the court. The court was designed not to prosecute just rebels and leaders who are deposed from countries that don't have any really strong friends among the P5. You know, it was designed to go after the big ones, the, the, the heads of state that commit crimes. And it's not evident they will ever be able to do that. Um, if you just think about all of the situations outside of Africa, you know, we've been pessimistic about Afghanistan and Palestine, and rightfully so. Should we be more optimistic that any of the, the members of the junta in Myanmar are going to end up in the dock at the ICC? Uh, should we imagine any Russian government official uh, who's responsible for crimes in Ukraine or Georgia is going to end up in the dock at the ICC? I don't see it. <laughs> I can't imagine a situation in which anything other than a relatively mid-ranking rebel is going to end up in a courtroom at the ICC. And that doesn't mean that that person doesn't deserve to be prosecuted. It doesn't mean that it's not worthwhile. It doesn't mean that it's not a success to convict that person. But that isn't really what the animating goal of the court was. And I think for the court to have a long-term future, again, as Alex kind of hinted at, we have to kind of define down our expectations of what the court can do. It can do some things, but it can't do others. And if we keep bemoaning the fact that it can't do all of the things that we hoped it would do, then we're only going to be dissatisfied with the court. We need to celebrate what it can do and let go of the dream of the things that it can't. Can I just Thanks. jump in quickly, uh, just yeah, very, very, very quickly, just to, just to echo what both Kevin and Alex have said, and I think that uh, what they really mean is that the the ambition and the sort of like the realistic outlook are not mutually exclusive, right? You can be ambitious and you can also be accept the limitations that you have. And this is what the court should be doing. We shouldn't abandon the ideals, but at the same time, we should be looking at our limitations and what we can do to overcome those limitations, of course, and, and, and the political situation shifts all the time. And so as it changes, perhaps the ICC will have a, you know, more successful record in the future. So yeah, those are just my two cents. Thanks, um, Talita. I'm going to try to get through a few more questions. Um, 
And I see a question here from Andrea to Kevin and then Alex. Um, and it's it's about the Afghanistan situation. What is your opinion about the the appeals chamber decision on Afghanistan, and in particular the expansive in, the extensive interpretation of the prosecutor's discretion? And the, she asks, is, in the future, won't it generate a lack of accountability and a waste of time if the preliminary chamber is a mere rubber stamping instance and cannot even control complementarity at the pretrial level? Uh, I, can be, have a I can be very brief uh, on that one. Um, there's actually a lot there and I could be very long, but really I just want to kind of <laughs> agree with the question that I think, you know, we've been talking about the importance of prosecutorial discretion, but it isn't an accident that the proprio motu power of the prosecutor was subjected by states to the check of the pretrial chamber approving the investigations. Um, and I do think that, you know, um, the, the, the pretrial chamber in Af the Afghanistan situation went way too far on infringing upon prosecutorial discretion. But I think, unfortunately, the pendulum swung too far back the other way with the appeals chamber, which basically doesn't give the pretrial chamber any ability at all to refuse used to open an investigation. They basically said, as long as there's one crime committed in the jurisdiction of the court, that's the only thing you can really review. That's not really a review at all. So I'm hopeful that as we get more jurisprudence in this area, the, the appeals chamber will kind of track back a little bit from its extreme uh, overreaction to the pretrial chamber's approach. Um, but right now, it is very difficult to see how a pretrial chamber could turn down a proprio motu investigation. And I, and I don't think that's consistent with the animating kind of goals of, of how the Rome Statute was written. Thanks, um, Kevin. Um, I'm just wondering, Alex, I saw a question there um, for you, yeah, but it was- I, I, I can answer that quickly. It's, okay. a, it's from Andrea. It's a, I think that's a good, it's a good question about how I, I mentioned that there needs to be more urgency um, in the culture of the office. And I think some of the others echoed that. And, um, and Andrea's question is, well, how do you do that? Uh, and I think uh, um, that's a management problem. Um, that is, that has to be led from the top. That is the, for me, the going to be um, a, a central uh, responsibility for the, pro for the new prosecutor to instill and drive the office because why? Why does that have to be? Because no one else will. There is no, as, as Andrea correctly points out, there's no timelines in the Rome Statute. There's no, nobody, there's no one else is going to be able to impose, um, impose any kind of urgency. It has to come from the top. Um, and so that's something I hope that um, Kareem will bring to the office when he, when he takes it over. Thanks, Alex. I'm gonna, I see another question from Faye, but I'm gonna first go to Owiso since, you know, you're on still. Owiso, are you there? Can you, um, can we see you? I see that your hand is up. Uh, yes, I hope you can hear me. Okay. Well, I have a problem with my camera. Yes, I, I, I can, we can hear you, great. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for a very illuminating discussion and for excellent moderation. Uh, listening to the panelists, I think a couple of things just, you know, hit me. First, it's, we get ICC out of the Africa uh, thing. You know, we get the sense that the uh, the prosecutor is trying to get the ICC out of Africa, literally, and change the bias narrative. And there are also questions of visibility of investigations, budgetary constraints, and the need to focus investigations. And that reminds me of something that one of the contributors to, to a, an opinion Yuri symposium we hosted recently said, that is Dr. Orina from iQuartz, and I quote, Whereas it's important for the court to underscore its independence by not backing away from controversial cases, it needs to rethink its strategy in selection of cases and situations to avoid pursuing mere symbolism. So listening to this discussion, I get the sense that the court is damned if it does and damned if it doesn't. So then where does that leave us? Where does that leave the court? And I would, would like to get a sense from the panelists whether they think that by moving out of Africa, to, so to speak, and you know, trying to open investigations in Palestine, Ukraine, Georgia, with all the political dynamics around it. Do you think that the court is pursuing mere symbolism, as Dr. Rina puts it? Um, thanks, Oiso. Um, 
Was that question directed at anyone in particular, or do we have any volunteers who want to jump in and take that well, one up? Is the ICC pursuing no. mere symbolism? That was a general one because everybody spoke about pretty much all these things. Okay. So anyone okay. can take it up. Any takers on this one, Kevin, Talita, Sarah? I mean, I know, I, I'm not sure if we have anybody on, on um, you know, who isn't on the panel. It, it doesn't have to be limited to our panelists, by the way. I know this is something that- I, I, can, um, say, I, can, say, I can say something about it. Um, sure, I mean, great. I can-, I can I, Well, I'll, I'll just say this, that um, I can say from my experience in the ICC, and, and, and I'm, it's, I think it's true e even after I left, based on my conversations and what I've observed, that I, I don't think that the, that the Office of the Prosecutor has ever you know, opened an investigation or pursued a case of, because of the symbolic grounds. I, I, I really don't think that the prosecutor is motivated by you know, I want I want to show this, or I want to balance, or I want I I I you know, obviously the pro the uh, the court and the prosecutor operate in a political environment. Choices are constrained. We've been talking about that. That is obviously a reality that the prosecutor is aware of, and and we've talked about how the prosecutor has to take that into account. But but the but these are these are serious decisions about you know, about opening investigations and, and, and making allegations and, and conducting investigations. And it's never done for symbolic value um, or for political gain or anything like that. It just, the people don't think like that in the office. Um, and so um, I think that they, they, the, they look for, you know, righteous, you know, places where it looks like crimes have been committed and they want, want to conduct investigations and then the discussion is where to best focus those efforts thanks alex um kevin i think as you want to jump in on that yes please just very very briefly um maybe a tiny dissenting view from what alex just said um i, I am Again, not that not that I believe the OTP engages in these kind of cold-blooded, let's just be relevant analysis, but I'm a little troubled by the Myanmar uh, investigation from this perspective. I, I, I'm not sure that the OTP needed to go out on a limb and really develop this kind of, I actually think it's legally correct, but kind of an innovative understanding of territorial jurisdiction. A, because they're not going to get their hands on any of the defendants that they really want to get their hands on, but B, because by trying to push this kind of unusual jurisdictional argument, they open the door to very valid criticism of, okay, well, if you're going to argue that in Myanmar, that if you know one element of the crime is, is committed on the territory of a state party, even though we're not really talking about crimes on that state, well, why not investigate Syria because of all the people pushed into Jordan? Why not investigate China because all of the people that are either pushed out of China or back into China? These are all legitimate Ex, you know, kind of extensions of the, the argument that was pioneered by the OTP. And I think that's kind of, kind of redounded not to their benefit in the long run. So I, I wish that, that they would stick a little bit more to kind of the core theories of where they have jurisdiction than perhaps they have in places like Myanmar. And then of course, just very briefly, there's the aspect of, you know, even if you have jurisdiction over the crimes against you know the the Rohingya in Bangladesh well the real problem is genocide <laughs> the real problem is mass killing the real problem is systematic sexual violence in Myanmar and none of those things are within the jurisdiction of the court so even if the court has jurisdiction it has jurisdiction over such a tiny sliver and not the most serious sliver of the situation that I don't really see what the practical benefit is of investigating. So um, again, I don't think they just wanted to be relevant, but I'm not sure they thought through all of the implications of pushing this particular approach. Having a few technical issues today. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I think um, I just want to go to one more question that I see. I don't know if there are any other hands that I may be missing. Um, I'll just quickly look through. 
because there is one issue that I wanted to throw out to the panelists. And these are a little bit surprise questions that I, I want to throw out. And it's to get all of us to begin to, to think, you know, to, to begin to look at what the OTP should look like. And, and, you know, we've talked a lot about some of the issues that have been problematic and some of the, I would say the strengths of Fatou Bensouda in terms of her leadership and her mandate. And we've, we've talked very briefly, we've touched on the strategic plan. But she had a very clear strategic plan with, I think it had six, there are six elements or six goals there that set out what she plans to do. In very short order, Kareem Khan is going to have to put together a strategic plan going forward. And one of the, I, I saw recently a, a briefing um, that UNITAD um, had before the Security Council. And one of the, the things that came up was the use of innovation, harvesting groundbreaking innovation and technology in terms of his approach to the UNITAD mandate. And it made me start to think about the, the OTP of the future in terms of, you know, he was strongly commended by Security Council members for harvesting groundbreaking technology, for being very focused in terms of the, the cases that, you know, he would prioritize. And thirdly, by a victim-centered and trauma-informed approach to his work. And, I, and fourthly, the public-private partnerships. So for example, one of the partners was Microsoft, and then you had also um, the University of Stanford and so on. Just before I take Faye's question, I'm just giving the, the panelists the last few minutes to think about how we see innovation, AI, technology, groundbreaking new methods. What do we see as some of the things that this new prosecutor will need to bring in to, to take things forward. And um, do we think that, that is, these things will be applicable in the case of the ICC where we've heard about so many limitations? Let me go to the question while you think about, while you think about that. I think there was a question from, from Faye, Paris. Um, Faye, are you still on? Yes, I am. Do you want to just go ahead? Quickly? Sure, absolutely. Hello, everyone. This has been an extraordinary panel, and I'm so happy that I had an opportunity to hear. And it's good to see all of you. Just, just briefly, and I would, I think I'm going to address this to Alex. Um, it's been a while, and I recall nice that a few years back, almost a decade actually, we actually had an interdepartmental panel on complementary approaches to addressing and assisting victims. And what I heard after that panel was that, well, this is really novel and wonderful. We've never done this before. So my question with respect to internal culture is how much do um, members of each, within each specific department actually talk to one another? How much of a narrative is there? Is there a space for narrative in terms of changing the cultural dynamics and, and you know, making people feel more a part of the community? Um, that's my first question. And, and actually the only one, I think it's just been a wonderful discussion overall. So, and, and it's not just limited to you if anyone else wants to chime in. Okay. Faye, Faye, if I can ask, just ask, when you say in the departments, you mean within the ICC, how much discussion is there? Within, specifically within the Office of the Prosecutor. So for example, we had a joint meeting with the, the head of the investigation division, the Pros PD, all of those different departments. And it was basically a round table on a particular thematic issue. And right. It was very interesting because at that juncture, it was the first time that other people had, you know, in a very relaxed, non-threatening manner, got to speak and hear just real time concerns of people about culture. In this instance, it was about um, victims needs and how do we how do we go about our daily tasks to approach this issue? So that's what I mean within the OTP. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And it's a very hard um, management issue. And when when you know, when I was when I was there, 
Um, and it's and it's kind of true of many of these courts. But when I was there, I would often talk about the office like like we were an emergency room, and we you know and we were like every day is you know you're just deluged with the kind of crisis of the day and this coming and this coming and that you know and so forth. And the structure of the office was such that it, um, because it was thought that there should be input from lots of different people, the, the, everybody got involved in every problem. So there was a lot of talk and discussion you know, on the emergency of the day. And, there, and to your point, there, there, it was very hard to have time to kind of step back. It was very hard to think bigger picture. It was very hard to, to, to do kind of um, different ways of thinking. Um, and I think that if the the only way to combat that because the 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 emergencies do come in it's just the nature of the work is to try to i think streamline the decision making process and assign responsibility to people so that they can resolve those things you know kind of efficiently in order to create more space for some of the bigger picture type of things that you know whether it's looking at the evidence in the case you know and stepping back and trying to think about the evidence in the case or some of the bigger cultural things or new ways of doing things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Faye, and thank you, Alex. Um, I think, Charles, did you want to ask a question? I don't know if I see any other questions here. So sure, thank you, Lorraine. If you don't have any questions, I'd rather have other people the opportunity. But it has been, of course, a fascinating uh, discussion. So thank you to all the panelists for really, really rich insights. Um, maybe just one uh, thought and a question, in a sense, uh, pushing back a little bit. And maybe, Alex, here I'm going to join a bit of Liz, the dreamers part of things. Uh, but I see a disjunction between what all of you are saying in terms of the court and having realistic expectations. Nobody's going to argue with that, definitely not me. The problem is, in a way, that suggests that the element where we could put a spotlight on the role of the state's parties, and I picked up on in Liz's question, the role of the ASP, right? So where is the ASP in all of this? So in my view, the ASP is really in a lot of this, both in terms of the fact that now it's easy to subcontract stuff to the court. So you send the ICC in, you know, very easy. You don't want to do hard stuff in Sudan. So here we get your ICC referral, right? You don't want to do stuff in Libya. Here we get your referral. But never backing it up with the resources and very importantly, the, the, the political support that the court would need once it gets involved in the situation. How does it manifest itself, as you all know, is you then get non-cooperation from states and all these unenforced arrest warrants, we haven't talked about those. And, and she can't arrest them as a prosecutor. Karim Khan is not gonna be able to do that. And we know we've seen that problem with the ad hoc tribunals, but when these states are pushed far enough, we think about the ICTY, perhaps because of the EU and conditionality, we eventually got cooperation. If you think about the, the continents, the ad hoc tribunals on the continent, something similar. So my point is, are we giving them a pass if we don't put a spotlight also on the role of the states, both in terms of the budget, so you say do more with less or no money at all, in circumstances where the statute actually requires you to pay for the referrals, right? And we know what, politically why. And then on the other part, when she has problems with non-cooperation, she comes back and asks for help or the future of Karim Khan, and they don't give any help to her. They just leave her out there. So are we giving the states a pass? If we say, just be realistic, this is the world of politics. I'll be very curious to hear thoughts on all of that. Thank you. Very interesting comments there, Charles, and I'm happy you, <laughs> you came back and threw that out. So who wants to take that one on? Because it is a, it's a really important point. I know there's been, in the, in the early days of the court, there was a lot of narrative about, you know, the ICC being the only hope for certain victims and affected populations. So, and then at the, at the same time, the ASP hasn't stepped up fully to the plate. Kevin, Alex, Talita, Sarah, do any of you want to tackle this, this question? I, I can say something briefly. I, I don't, I, 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 I'll just say, I'll say briefly that I don't, I actually don't think that the prosecutors have given the states a pass. Um, they have, 
um, Ben Suda and also uh, Ocampo have repeatedly on so many occasions put the spotlight on lack of cooperation. The uh, Fatou Ben Suda has gone repeatedly to the Security Council about Sudan and, and Libya and not giving enough support. Um, they have pounded the table about cooperation, gone to the court about non-cooperation. They have gone to the ASP about a, a bigger budget. Um, Fatou Ben Souda devised a, um, she did a, a, a study about what the ideal size of the court should be, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the OTP should be, so that it's not just asking for more money, but a, a, a rationale, whole justification. The states just ignored it. And the, 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 the reality, I, I don't think that the, the court has the, 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 the states will, will support the court when it's in their interest to do so, when they perceive it's in their interest to do so. So with the, with the ad hoc tribunals, they were supportive of those courts. They had invested in setting them up. They had an interest in them succeeding. They supported them, and when they support them, as you said, on conditionality at the ICTY and you know at the other courts, um, they will succeed. Um, that that's you know I, I I don't think I don't want to give up on pounding the table on the spotlight, um, but I'm not very optimistic that that is going to change much. The states just don't care. Yeah, maybe, maybe other stakeholders then should name and shame them rather than just the prosecutor. Yeah, right. I mean, starting with academics. Yeah. So, so, so that's what I actually had in mind is more us as in, us in the academic mode, right? The world of academia. Are we, if you say, and I remember very distinctly, I think Alex, she showed up at the Security Council. She's like, basically like, I've had it, right? You can't right. send me in all the situations and back me up. And it's like, it ends there. But, but what I'm saying as the academic community, this is to Liz's point. Then we say, no, no, you also have accountability. So one of the things I don't like about the IR report, they gloss over the role of the SP. And the state's parties. And I think that's an important facet of the whole system. But thank you very I, much. That's very, very, very. I, very I totally agree with that point. I, I absolutely thousand percent agree with that point. That's a hundred percent. That's absolutely right. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> Kevin, you're, you're silent. Are, do you want to weigh in on this one? Sarah? Kevin's falling asleep. <laughs> <laughs> just, just to mention that uh, uh, the failure of the SP repeatedly to provide an adequate budget to the prosecutor, to the court, essentially sets up the court to fail. Um, we have, uh, and I believe that all the most of the key recommendations in the IER report um, will not be effectively implemented if the ASP is not willing to uh, provide the necessary resources. So, for example, uh, when the when it mentions increased field presence, um, hire more local staff, engage more with the local actors, establish uh, intermediary interlocutors, or other um, focal points, rather, all these need resources, and that won't happen. And similarly, for cases, um, if the ASP doesn't uh, firmly um, take action against states that do not cooperate with the court, then again, there's very little that the prosecutor can do in that situation. So really, I, I agree that uh, uh, the, the ASP should be held accountable for its shortcomings in uh, the whole picture of how the court operates. Thanks, Sarah. And I think it leads me to, um, if there are no additional questions or comments, um, I would really love to hear your thoughts on, on you know, what I posed, but on anything, on any aspect of the discussion um, that has gone on so far as sort of final words. And my, my specific um, question is in relation to the ICC of the future, because, you know, in an, in an era where we're dealing with um, harnessing the, the technological advances that we are seeing, um, we're going to have to see a very different, um, I think, prosecutorial strategy, prosecutorial approach. One of the things we've heard is about the need for more focus and smaller um, cases. So I, I'm just wondering whether our panelists have any thoughts on that, sort of the ICC OTP of the future, what that could mean, or any thoughts, final words on what has gone on so far. Can I start with that? 
because uh, I risk losing my notes because my dog has tried to eat my, my piece of paper twice already. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, and also because I, I, I'm, I'm currently very interested in, in, in digital technologies. And so this is a really interesting topic uh, and it's, it's really um, right up my alley. So I think that, um, you know, the, the promise of groundbreaking technologies, we have to take it with a pinch of salt. Of course, it's, it's going to lower the cost. It has the potential to lower the costs because they can be very efficient. So for example, if you have let's say a digital sort of like a process uh, system, a digital system for submission, for hearings, it would streamline the procedures uh, to a great extent. But at the same time, it's not a silver bullet. AI, uh, you know, cyber technologies, it's not going to solve the world. You know, if you think about AI, it's purely quantitative. Right, what they do is just they do statistics. And so you need a human being to actually evaluate. So for example, thinking about analytics of say hate speech or analytics about you know mapping of a conflict situation, all of that needs to be an analyzed by a human being. So we shouldn't put too much hope in these technologies, but definitely they help in terms of efficiency. And we've seen some of these changes already happening in the COVID era, right? Because now everything needs to be done remotely. So there is great potential for, for more streamlined uh, proceedings in terms of, and also a move, a shift towards more written procedures, which I, I think should have already happened at the ICC. This whole orality, the whole theater, I think that should be uh, sort of like reduced a little bit. I think it doesn't do, uh, it, it doesn't help the court in its image. I think it just puts too much pressure on it and it should keep a lower key profile in my opinion. And I think technology should help in that respect. Thanks, Talita. Thank you. Um, Kevin, I see. Yeah, I just wanna hop in briefly because I mean, I, I very, very strongly agree with Talita on that point. And, you know, I, I'm not a Luddite by any stretch of the imagination, but I, I guess I would leave, you know, leave us with a plea for just basic competence. You know, I mean, yes, we need digital evidence and we need all the fancy programs and all of that, but what we really need are well-trained investigators who, who know how to talk to witnesses, who know how to talk to the victims of sexual violence. We need prosecutors who understand how to put a case theory together and you know, assemble proof in a way that will satisfy the burden of proof on all of the material elements of the crimes. No technology is ever going to substitute for that kind of human skill. And, and there's been a lot of that skill in the OTP, but there hasn't been enough of it. Um, and it's gotten better over time, but hopefully Kareem Khan will kind of continue that trajectory and make it even better. And, and we just can't forget that this is, as Talita said, a fundamentally human-based exercise and no technology in the world will compensate for poorly trained and, and poorly skilled humans. Um, um, thank you, if, if I may. Uh, just building from what uh, Talita said, that uh, we do also need to be cautious. And I think COVID has demonstrated that while uh, digital uh, and innovative approaches may help uh, the court be more efficient, but we also be, have to be mindful that they may perpetuate inequality in this case in terms of who has access. Um, we've seen uh, uh, just a very simple example, for instance, the roundtables that occur, the discussions that have been taking place on uh, the digital space um, really have excluded certain voices. Um, again, uh, using a very interesting example, um, the prosecutor, we are talking about the prosecutorial election. I mean, we saw the process where one of the candidates from Uganda, we have very horrible internet. She could not, uh, she just kept going off and uh, until eventually the court permitted her to use the court premises. So that, uh, uh, what, what I would like to stress is this really is useful embracing uh, digital uh, approaches and technology, but we have to be uh, careful that this does not further perpetuate this um, inequality and hierarchies that may exist in terms of who is closer to the court, who has access to the court, who is able to engage with the court and who isn't. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Sarah. And if I, um, if Alex? I could just, yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with those points, but I'll talk about technology in a different way, which is about 
um, you, uh, technology in terms of um, collecting evidence and investigations. And there, I have to say that I think um, that while technology and digital evidence and of the and, and so forth is not a silver bullet and we shouldn't get oh, you know over oh, like that's going to solve the problems of the ICC. I do think that that kind of evidence has the potential to revolutionize this field, absolutely revolutionize it. Um, I think in 50 years, this field will look different because of that, because of evidence that can be collected by, I mean, just think about cell phone evidence. I mean, we know about the dramatic effect that that's had on domestic prosecutions. It's also having it beginning to have an effect on international criminal investigations. Mm -hmm being able to film, record, um, you know, uh, planning crimes. Um, there's a case at the ICC, it's now dismissed because the, the, or the accused is, was killed, but that was based completely on filmed evidence. Um, evidence that is collected from satellites, from the sky, evidence that's transmitted by, you know, by email or by text messages um, that can be captured and hacked. The, the, the kind of evidence that's being created by our digital world um, creates opportunities for investigators and prosecutors. And in, in our domestic systems, I, there's there are debates about the anxiety of the state and prosecutors having too much access to that evidence and too much power and so forth. In the, inter, in the world of international criminal law, where prosecutors are are, don't have enough power and are, are, are short on power, this, this could be a potentially um, changing kind of evidence. It, it's not a simple thing because there's always questions of how you get access to it and how it becomes available and so forth. And, um, but I do think that there is enormous potential um, for the future in this kind of evidence. And if I may just uh, add one last thing and tied into with what you mentioned, Alex, it's the safety of those who are collecting this evidence, those who are recording these videos, those who are sharing this evidence. And the court will really have to rethink how um, it protects such uh, persons because obviously they are in contexts where uh, they, uh, they face enormous risk. Um, getting this information places them at enormous risk. So the court will also have to think of how to guarantee the safety of those who... Thank you, um, Sarah, and thanks, Alex, for ending on that note. And, you know, thank you to all the panelists. I know I, I certainly would love to, to continue this discussion, but um, I don't think that Charles will allow me to and the other organizers. So um, it just leaves me to take the last remaining minutes to wrap up uh, what has been a phenomenal discussion. Um, I think I just want to give my own impressions because I don't want to use all of the time, but I wanted to also highlight a couple of the, some of the key, what I consider to be important takeaways um, just from the discussion, but I think more broadly that there, I got the sense that there was general agreement on the fact that um, Fatou Ben Souda has done, um, you know, an, an, a very, a very good job. And maybe that's just my impression, but uh, she, given spending 18 years as in a senior leadership role in the OTP, she has done a phenomenal job of moving some issues forward and particularly in relation to, and I think this was highlighted by the, the woman on the panel, the fact that she put in place some very important policy papers, in particular the, um, the, the policy paper on sexual and gender-based crimes. And I won't go over that. We saw that there were gaps um, in terms of her gender push internally. And um, I think the IER report highlighted that as well. And we're hoping that if the incumbent prosecutor hires a senior um, deputy prosecutor, uh, deputy prosecutor, sorry, who is female, that will help to remedy some of the gender imbalance at at that level. Um, and Kevin mentioned the fact that she she didn't get enough credit for refusing to open the Kamora's investigation. I think that um, tied into broader discussions about how she stood her ground in the face of a lot of pushback to her independence and the exercise of her discretion. But there are some concerns that have been raised, um, and you know, to to use a word that Kevin used, which is that 
she was bequeathing a mess to her successor with the number of investigations that will be open that very few of them see, may have um, a great prospect of success. So there are those issues that Kareem Khan will need to, to consider. Will these investigations um, lead anywhere? Will there be cooperation in relation to pursuing these investigations? And the, the, the broader question that came up during the discussion on the case selection and prioritization is something that was mentioned in the IER report and Talita spoke to that and Alex, the issue of the feasibility question and the issue of transparency. Um, I think the, the issue of transparency, I saw a discussion on both sides and particularly I noted what Alex said about the, the fact that transparency is important, but internally dealing with these issues, it's actually quite complex. What my takeaway was that it was very clear that there is an important need, and this came across all the speakers, an important need to streamline decision-making processes within the OTP. And there was a, a particular need to focus in terms of the number of investigations that are open. Um, and I think almost all the speakers admitted that the court has limitations. And um, it was suggested that we should perhaps accept the limitation of the court, some of them being structural limitations. But the question is, despite these limitations, how can the OTP be effective in terms of the investigations they open and, um, and actually investigations that, that lead to a conviction? As Alex says, without cases, the court is built for cases. Um, I found that quite interesting, by the way, because I think the first prosecutor who is not, we're not discussing here, but the first prosecutor had said, well, the success of the ICC was measured by the absence of cases, but that's a matter for a, a separate discussion. <laughs> um, um, it, there, there was, Kevin made it clear that, and I think Alex as well, for the court to have any chance to be relevant, it has to be successful. And we, I think looked at and Sarah brought in the really important perspective of the need for engagement at a regional level with stakeholders and particularly stakeholders within affected communities, civil society organization, echoing what the independent expert review panel said. I wanted to end with what was said in terms of the value of technology and the sort of forward looking view of the court. What is the ICC and the OTP of the future? And Alex mentioned the fact that there is tremendous potential and advancements with, with the use of technology. It can revolutionize the way investigations are approached. But others have noted that there should this should be approached with caution. And I wanted to quote Kevin on this as well, where he said, no technology will substitute for a fundamental human expertise. And Sarah, that was also your point. I think overall, we're clear that while Fatou Bensouda has achieved a, quite a bit in her tenure as prosecutor, there are a number of issues that will be left in the hand of Kareem Khan. And the question is, going back to what Charles said at the end, will he have the political support, the support of the ASB, and a broader level of support from other stakeholders to be able to carry that through. I think the first place that we're gonna have to look is what does he have lined up as a strategic plan? That will set out, I think, for all of us, his vision for the, the Office of the Prosecutor and where things are likely to go. So allow me again to thank the organizers of this event, to remind you that this, um, event will shortly be available on YouTube. And to say that there will be another event in this series. Um, that's correct, right, Charles? There will be a third event and information about that can be found on the website of the organizers. And once that all three events are up on YouTube, of course, we encourage you, by the way, to continue the discussion on Twitter. For example, if you have thoughts that we weren't able to pick up here, tweet something and let the, con the discussion continue. Thanks again, and thanks to the great panelists.
Do I have the privilege of ending fully or Charles, will you press the leave button? Thank you, everyone. I can do it. You've done such a great job. Thank you to everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.